All right, we are back at it today, and we're going to talk about part two of the aims and results of Fidel Castro's domestic policies. So with regard to Castro's social policies, uh, one of his major focuses was on education in Cuba. In 1961, the Castro regime will nationalize all schools in Cuba and close all the religious schools in Cuba. Uh, the only religious education that could take place would be within the churches themselves. Programs for gifted and talented students would be established, and often the government would dictate the educational paths that students would take based on the students' skills and abilities. Counter-revolutionary teachers would be fired, new textbooks would be adopted, and libraries would be purged of any material that was deemed inappropriate or contrary to the revolutionary ideals. Education in Cuba was meant to serve the revolution. Cuba also instituted what was called the Exemplary Parenthood Program, where parents had to demonstrate that they were taking an active role in their child's education. Regular visits to school, supervising the learning and homework at home, uh, ensuring strong attendance, and ultimately, this ended up being very successful in creating one of the highest literacy rates uh, in the world for Cuba. Young men in Cuba were conscripted to three years of national service in the military or for social or economic work. With regard to women in Cuba, they played an important role in Castro's rise to power, uh, prominent in the 26th of July movement prior to uh, the, uh, the takeover of power. A woman's guerrilla brigade uh, supported the Castro revolution from the mountains of the Sierra Maestra. The Cuban Women's Federation would be formed early in Castro's rule in 1960, and by 1975, three quarters of all Cuban women were a part of the FMC. This supported Cuba's literacy, a uh, push to literacy, training uh, young women uh, in domestic skills, promoting hygiene, which improved health outcomes in Cuba, and organizing daycare centers across Cuba. In 1975, the Cuban Family Code uh, tried to address some of the inequalities that women were still dealing with, especially within the household. Husbands and wives were now legally entitled to the same rights uh, to be educated and to pursue careers, and careers that often went into the professional, moving beyond uh, traditional roles like nursing and teaching. They also called the Cuban uh, Family Code also called for equal domestic responsibilities at home. Women's participation in the workforce would rise from just 13% prior to the revolution to upwards of 43% uh, by 1975. But Cuba was still very much a patriarchal society. Only 25% of people in managerial positions were women. One third of the National Assembly in the 1970s uh, were women. And it was only until 1986 that the first Politburo member, the highest echelon of the Communist Party in Cuba, was a woman. Women also dealt with what was called the double burden, uh, working outside of the home, but still, despite the family code of 1975, having primary domestic responsibilities inside the home. With regard to religion, uh, Cuba is predominantly a Catholic nation, but there are also Afro-Cuban religions and smaller groups of Protestants and Jews in Cuba. Now, officially, under the Castro regime, Cuba would be an atheist state. Uh, remember, in communism, uh, religion uh, and communism really do not mix from the earliest days of the Communist Manifesto and Karl Marx. In 1992, Castro softened a bit on this and declared that Cuba in a new constitution was merely a secular state, not an atheist state. Some Catholic clergy saw the early revolution as an opportunity for social and economic justice for Cubans, but others were very concerned about the atheism that was present in the communist world. Now, Castro himself was raised Catholic and went to a Jesuit school, but he was an atheist. For churches to survive in Cuba under Castro's rule, they had to act largely outside of politics. They, they could not be seen as being counter-revolutionaries uh, in Cuba, or else they would suffer from persecutions from the state. 
Now, during some of the worst economic conditions in Cuba during the special period in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union, church attendance actually grew uh, in Cuba. Now, with regard to treatment of minorities, uh, the largest minority in Cuba would be the Black Cubans, the descendants of the enslaved Africans that had harvested sugar on plantations in Cuba for centuries prior to the abolition of slavery in the late 19th century. Their social status in Cuba was among the lowest, both before and after the revolution. Most Black Cubans were supportive of the revolution with hopes that that would bring social and economic justice. Uh, and improvements, but but it really didn't. Now, the government did formally outlaw racial segregation, though Black Cubans still remained an economic underclass with very little access to the Cuban political system. Castro's rhetoric about civil rights was more anti-American as the United States was dealing with um, the civil rights movement in the Jim Crow South. It didn't really translate to action or equality in Cuba. Cuba also under Fidel Castro was intolerant of homosexuality where, where homosexuals in Cuba were labeled as social deviants. Many being placed in special army units, these military units to aid production, uh, for rehabilitation for them. In labor camps, uh, they would be forced to work where persecutions and abuse would be common. In 1979, Cuba officially decriminalized homosexuality, but persecutions in society did persist. Later in his life, after he stepped down from rule, Castro did admit to what he called great injustices against the homosexuals in the early years of the Cuban Revolution. Now, there were economic and social gains under Castro's rule, which you could argue contributed to his maintenance of power. Cuban universal health care received international praise uh, for the developing world. It's got one of the best health care systems in the world, and even many of their outcomes end up being even better than what we see here in the United States. Uh, 530 doctors for every 10,000 people in Cuba made it the second best place for health care access in Latin America. The lowest infant mortality rates in Latin America. One of the highest life expectancies anywhere in the Americas. And a literacy rate that was over 98% uh, with universal free education all the way through uh, university if a student went that far. We'll see you next time.